This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blayton. And this week we're joined by our fellow Sound Notion TV podcaster, Anthony Joseph. Um, <laughs> what are you doing, like, Mercier's? Com- com- comments from the peanut gallery. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Anthony. You know, before uh, before we were interrupted by Sam's cheering for you, uh, as I was saying, you're a fellow Sound Notion TV podcaster. You have a new show um, that has been relaunched on the on the network here, All the Cool Parts, which is very, very good. So everyone listening should also check that podcast out. Um, Anthony is also a composer, and he plays the the guitar. I think that's how you say oh, that. The guitar. Is that right? Oh, guitar. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, is that great. right, Anthony? Can you correct us on that? Well, guitar... Um... That's how you say it for my home state of Texas. Nice. That's right. cool. do you, yeah. Now, do you also play the keytar? No, I've never played the keytar. I'm a horrible keyboard player. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would not be good. So, Anthony, uh, we're going to start off because you're a composer, and I feel like we often forget to talk to our composers about composing things. Um, you've got a number of very cool projects going on right now. Uh, aside from your cool podcast that, that Patrick just mentioned, um, tell us about this concerto that you're working on, because I think this is a really interesting project. Well, um, I'm writing this concerto for a group in Madison, Wisconsin, called Clocks in Motion. Uh, they're a percussion ensemble, so it's five percussionists and a pianist. And uh, so I'm writing this concerto for uh, eight-string electric guitar, which you can kind of see behind my shoulder and uh uh percussion ensemble so it should be interesting we're going to premiere it may 30th up in madison so so that so it strikes me when you tell me that you're writing a thing for uh guitar and percussion that there's a lot of potential for um kind of uh pop and rock influence and i know that you come uh, to music, or you came to music from rock originally, um, yes. and I know that's something that you talk about on your show uh, quite a bit. I wonder if you could maybe uh, ex- explain your relationship with with classical music through um, through rock through your rock background. Well, I told this story on all the cool parts. I did this um, classical music stories episode. But uh, what introduced me to classical music, I was always a rock kid, and um, I didn't go to music school until I was 23. That's when I started. Um, Before that, I was in a metal band in Houston, Texas. And we would uh, play in Houston and sort of uh, tour around that circuit of sort of Austin and Dallas and New Orleans and that that circuit. And uh, in the early 90s, which this is when this was, um, one of my favorite bands was Faith No More. I don't know if you guys remember them. But um, yeah, on one of their albums, that. they have this song called Malpractice. And at the end of Malpractice, they sample uh, sections of Dmitry Shostakovich's Eighth String Quartet from the yes. Kronos Quartet album Black Angels. And uh, I just heard this string music, and I thought it sounded, you know, really awesome. You can see my cat back there. That's uh, right. That's right. And, uh, what is it? Uh, Hey, the metal guys don't have cats. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> he is the most awesome cat ever, okay? He shreds. Uh, he shreds. He's a vicious he totally man eater. He totally shreds. Uh, he really does totally shred on the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, in all serious guys, he <laughs> actually does shred. Yes. Um, so uh, there was this song, and I went in the liner notes to figure out where the samples came from, and it said Kronos Quartet, Black Angels, and I had no idea what that was, but. I went out to um, to a record store. Mm-hmm. I know that's just like way, way back, you know. And the record stores yeah. actually had yeah. classical music sections. And uh, <laughs> I bought this album and turned it on, and Black Angels came on and, and completely freaked me out. And uh, and that was it. I mean, that I was hooked from then on, and I started um, trying to write classical music. Of course, I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, I decided to go to music school. So that's how that happened. Yeah. Man, Black Angels is your first exposure to contemporary music is pretty... That's a, that's a trial by fire. 
What did it you, is. Th- what did mean, you it, think? You said you were totally freaked out, but what? I, I can't imagine just putting on a record and hearing Black Angels out of context. I, I, I'm sure that the first time I heard that piece, I, it was with a lot of preparation. Like, okay, kids, right. we're going to listen to this thing, and it's super loud and super <laughs> crazy. Don't pass out. Right. And, but, right. Yeah, but it's super loud and super crazy. Don't pass out. You could say the same thing about a, a metal show, you know. Well, that's but that's what got me. That's the quality, I think. Yeah, exactly. Well, sure. It's a it's a yeah. very metal thing, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I put it on. I I didn't know what to expect, um, and I got that, and I was listening to it, and I was kind of in the back of my mind thinking, you know, this is more hardcore than the the Faith No More song that I just came from. You know that uh, uh, that opening string sound is the equi- the string quartet equivalent of stuffing your guitar into the amp and making it make noise. You know? <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, and you know that piece came out of the '60s. You know when there was a lot of sonic experimentation going on, and I I can't help but think that um, George Crumb was in some way inspired by that stuff that was going on and, and you know that was part of the piece so yeah I mean it created this bridge and um, that's how I got into it so yeah I feel like yeah. the people that are doing uh, kind of Anthony we're getting a little feedback from you do you have headphones that you can grab yes I do uh, thanks man uh, so I feel like a lot of the people that were doing kind of weird things around then were aware of the other people doing weird things in other genres more than they are today probably or, or maybe not I, I maybe it's that the people that are doing weird things are more curious and are are more interested in things that are going on in in, in other spaces and you know we there's a, been a lot made of the uh kind of quasi relationship between Stockhausen and the Beatles and I, I feel like this is a, a similar thing between weird stuff in the 60s in pop music and weird stuff in the 60s in in concert music and then the same thing now we you know Sam is fond of as 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 you may have if you have ever heard him talk for more than 15 minutes is fond of Radiohead <laughs> And uh, sure. and likes, <laughs> likes the weird things that they do, and I think that's not a coincidence that that okay. people that are curious and, and and experimenting with sounds in concert music are 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 interested in the experiments that people are doing in popular music. Sure, and I think at the time, you know, that we're talking about, it was a lot more novel, and I think everybody was, you know, aware of it. Especially, you know, the stuff that Jimi Hendrix was doing and the real psychedelic um, noise stuff that was going on at the end of the '60s. I don't think that just musicians were aware of that. I think pretty much everybody was aware of that because it was so different and so novel at the time. Now it's a, you know, it's it's not quite as shocking, right? Um, as it was back then, but um, it's harder to be novel. It is. It is harder to be to be novel. So um, that novelty has kind of since passed, I think. But I think back then, I think pretty much everybody was aware of. Um, that experimentation that was going on, even in huge periodicals, you know, um, there would be uh, articles about experimental composers and experimental painters and stuff like that, and which you never see uh, now. Really. Yeah. So, yeah. Have you done in all the cool parts on uh, Black Angels? I have it. That would be a cool one. That would be a very cool one a to cool do. One. Yeah, uh, I think I'll have to put that on the list. So to tie back to this concerto, how how is that uh, rock background, or is that rock background, playing into this this new piece? Because it it seems like with that medium there would be a lot of opportunity uh, to make those yes. connections. Well, yeah, I mean that that's a big thing um, in my music. <clears throat> um, early on, I was really. Uh, influenced by the the early bang on a can recordings from the 90s and groups like dr nerve guys like um um, nick dikovsky and stuff these people that were playing um electric guitar you know with acoustic instruments in the classical context Uh, scott johnson is another one that's a big uh influence on me and uh i I mean, you know, through through school, the, having the rock background was, I think, a good thing and a bad thing. You know, sometimes I think uh, 
certain people wanted to suppress that side of me. Um, I, I even, I mean, I even had in a master class one time a, a very famous New York composer that teaches at Juilliard. Tell, he told me to never listen to rock music again. Mm. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, so a lot of times I felt like I had to to fight to uh, to well, keep my identity. But well, I mean, this that's right. Nameless. It's a little name nameless doesn't matter. But okay. um, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's that is who I am. That's a huge part of who I am, and that's you know, was my musical life up and through my early twenties and stuff. And uh, you know, to just sort of pretend that that didn't exist it just doesn't make sense you know it's just part of who i am as an artist so yeah. yeah well and and one of one of our favorite topics on the show is the the ways that the uh, kind of creative model of pop music and, and rock music in particular of, of a band is influencing um the the new creative models for concert music and the the really tight knit collaboration and the, the 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 development of a work with a group over time. Um, yes. And and uh, so you, this group that you're writing for is in Wisconsin, and you are not too far away in Indiana, right? Right. Um, right. Are you getting together with them? Yes. So that's a big part of this piece. Um, is you know getting together with them with uh, for rehearsals and um, not quite. You know, uh, most of it is completely notated like a normal classical music piece would be, but then there's other parts of it that are very loosely notated. And I went over this with them, you know, ahead of time to make sure that they were comfortable with this. And uh, so I went up, uh, I've been up there one time, we rehearsed the third movement, it has a lot of drum set in it. And uh, I wrote out a drum set part and I told them, you know, you can do this that I wrote out and it'll be fine, but feel free to just do your thing and be free with it and come up with your own ideas. And it was, I mean, it was a joy to make. It wasn't a, something where he was struggling with a bunch of complicated rhythms. You know, he was going off what I wrote and just having so much fun with it and just, you know, running with it. And in that way, it was kind of like a rock band rehearsal. So it's a kind of mix. And I think you're right. I think there are groups that are doing this. Like uh, I just talked a lot about this with Brad Wells on my podcast, you know, that room full of teeth do this. This is a huge part of how they operate, you know, and how they come up with their music and their techniques and all this stuff. So I, I yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic way of generating, I think, original ideas and coming up with original sounds and it's a mode of operation that academic or classical music doesn't know how to appreciate i don't think we don't know how to handle music that's generated that way well yeah and i think one thing that i you know love working with uh, groups like clocks in motion and and having this collaboration with them is that these people are amazing musicians you know do they I mean? also With, have a rock background? What well, some of them do. I mean, they're percussionists. You know, and many percussionists also come, like guitar players. You know, uh, come up through a rock background, and uh, every percussionist they love has it. at least a little bit of rock background. That's that's right. You know, so um, they're they're amazing players. They're amazing musicians, and you know, I I love the collaborative process, and I want these musicians to be musicians. I don't want them to necessarily just execute um, everything I put down on paper to to the exact, you know, note and all, all that stuff. I want them to be musicians, you know, and bring out their talents to bring their talents to the music. So now I'm reading on their website. It's describing the project. It says it's a, a project with three composers. Yes. Um, ben Irwin, uh, yourself and Laura Schwending, Schwendiger. Schwind Don't hurt Schwind yourself. Schwindinger. Stretch. Schwindinger. 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 I'm going to pull you know, anything. I know, um, I know Ben Irwin. He's actually a, a, a really, really good composer um, and a nice, very nice guy. Well, what I'm interested in is it says featuring microtonal instruments built by members of Clocks in Motion. Now, are you uh, using this aspect in your piece? Yes. So they, uh, one of the instruments they made was called it's called a galvatone. They named it. It's basically just galvanized steel pipes that have been 
um, tuned and arranged like a keyboard, uh, like right. a mallet keyboard instrument. Oh. Um, and there's two of them that are tuned a quarter tone apart. Um, mm. So I'm using those in one of the, uh, well, I think pretty much the whole concerto. Um, and then uh, they've, you know, done like a, a group, an instrument called a quarimba, which is like a marimba that's, or two marimbas that are tuned a quarter tone apart. And um, they've done several pieces. They're working with a composer um, who's really big into that. And his name is escaping me right now. He's a Madison composer. But uh, yeah, yeah, they've done a lot of their own instrument building. And it's yeah, very cool. Well, I have a very geeky technical question then about your piece. <laughs> Yeah. Knowing knowing that they have that, because uh, you talk about like playing in a metal band and sometimes like you know tight unison lines that are you know crazy and everybody's playing in unison are sometimes an aspect of that music. Do you do any of that? And do you do it with like sustained like strange intervals? Like I would love to hear a line like that where it's some microtonal interval that's sustained over the course of a long line. <laughs> um. Like yeah, I think I do. I mean, I don't. I definitely don't approach the microtonal thing like your guest last week, right? Um, you know, not even, uh, not even close. I mean, I just view it like um, it's uh, it's kind of a, f- a fuller, richer sound, right? Mm-hmm. That you get, you know, with these, you know, wavering uh, tones, and I, I, you know, really don't. Uh, think about how many cents, you know, Acoustics. tuning things by, by sense and all that um, stuff. Um, so uh, it's just sort of an overall sound I'm, I'm trying to get. And I, I heard these Galvatones in a video that they did for some of their pieces. And it's just, you know, it's just amazing sound. So I just thought, yeah, I have, I have to use that. Yeah. yeah, it's it. I can I can only imagine. I would I would love to hear them uh, sometime. Do, they, do you know if they have any stuff online where you could, where I, where I could go listen to these sounds? Because uh huh, they have a YouTube channel. Oh and, man, uh, they do, and do they have channel. the Galvatone with the, on yes. there? Yes, yeah. yes. So they have some pieces with the Galvatones and the the Quarimbas and and uh, some other videos of them demonstrating other instruments. And one cool thing that I did for this piece that I thought was cool was before I started it, I emailed the entire group and I said, you know, if you have any instruments that you really love to play or that you specialize in, um, let me know. We created this Google document where they all wrote down their favorite instruments that they wanted to play. And then these are the main instruments that they're playing in the piece. You know, these are what are making up the piece. And um, for instance, one of the members loves playing this Brazilian tambourine called Pandiero. And he sent me a video of him playing this thing, which I was totally blown away by because he's making this tambourine sound like an entire drum set. Yeah. And uh, he has never gotten to play this instrument in Clocks in Motion. And I just thought, that's a crime, you know? So, um, you know, I have this whole extended thing for Pandiero and, um, it, you know, I just really like doing stuff like that, tailoring pieces for the people that I'm writing for. And, yeah. and if you've not seen this instrument, you should definitely check it out. It's 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 a it's kind of a small tambourine. Right. And, yeah. And uh, it, the techniques that people use to play it are just it's a really complex set of 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 damping and hitting in in different ways and in different places on the instrument so like you said you get this huge variety of sounds out of this seemingly very simple looking instrument it's it's yeah yeah it's like um uh what it's like it's like all of the variety of sounds that you can get from a conga almost right like yeah. there's all these different crazy sounds that you can make from this one very simple percussion instrument it's yeah like so well, what so glad to hear that you're you're using it yeah what struck me about the pandiero it, are were the bass sounds that you can get out yeah. of this very small instrument it was it was incredible so yeah and it's like a yeah. party thing like it, it would be a, a for for carnival right it's brazilian right yes uh yes. And, and so like people can carry it around with them is the the whole port the that's right size of it nate yep. you're smiling I was just going to say, yeah, if you've got, like, so this is such a specialized instrument and like takes a long time to develop those skills. So yeah, if you've got a guy who can totally shred on a Pandiero, 
You got to use it for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he totally shreds. <laughs> um, I learned how to play Bones once because I had a friend who was doing a master's degree in yeah, like those ethnic are also really complex. And then, and we watched. We he of course ordered a instructional Bones DVD, <laughs> and like you never realize how much just check it the duck at the duck at you that you managed yeah. to make that happen. And then you watch a virtuoso do it. And he's gotten one in both hands and. Just, if you're not familiar, Sam, explain Bones for people that, that have not seen Bones well, before. They're called that are bones, not from the American like, Southeast. Right. They're, a bone, they're Bones. Imagine uh, like the rib bones of some herd animal, you know, that are maybe, you know, five to eight inches long. And they both curve away from each other like this. You hold those in your hands a certain way. And when you shake your hand, it makes a triple rhythm. Tucka to shake it to tucka to tucka to tucka. So that's like. A traditional Irish instrument, and it's the traditional one, two, three, da 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 da. While the jig is going on, the guy is doing the bones like that. I think of them as like a slightly more sophisticated version of the spoons. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, but they're they're very cool, and 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 you can find on YouTube tons of videos of people showing off their bones chops. In fact, yeah. that sounds like I just filled up my <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so. So. Uh, I'm, the, the, this conversation about this concerto is really, really interesting, uh, and you, it's premiering next month. Ah, uh, May thirtieth. Excellent, Madison. excellent. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a thing that, that that maybe I don't know if you guys are interested in talking about because we it's kind of well canvassed on the show. But a lot of the guests that we have on our show are from where Patrick lives in New York City, mm -hmm. and none of us live in New York City except for Patrick and. You do not live in New York City either. What is your experience like trying to make new concert music in Indiana? Uh, do you ever you wish know, that you were in Brooklyn? I don't know. I not really. Um, <laughs> but I I do. I, he doesn't I'm have enough flannel. Yeah, I'm interested in going somewhere else. I mean, right now I'm living in Terre Haute, Indiana, and there is really. Um, nothing going on here um it's it's mm. it's tough you know to get to get things played and um that's one reason why i started playing so much guitar you know is when i finished school and i came out of indiana university which is really kind of an an unreal never never land of music you know where you can find um you know hundreds and hundreds of anybody to play anything that you write you know and they're when great of, and they're all yeah. great right so um when you're out of that environment, you know, uh, I found myself with very, very few opportunities. And I figured, you know, I've got to start playing my own music. And because uh, I didn't really play that much when I was in school. And uh, I started playing the guitar and playing my own music and just really bringing it back to to the beginning, which was basically playing music for the joy of it and writing music for you and your friends to play. And that's what I started doing. And I just, you know, whoever I was friends with, um, I would say, hey, you, you know, you want to do a piece? And I would write a piece for myself and, and them to play. And then we'd record it. And that's sort of how it started. And, um, you know, now I'm having some other opportunities out in other places, which is nice. But um, that's really what it came back to. You know, well, so. so that's an interesting thing that you mentioned is writing for your friends and, and playing with your friends. And that, that makes me think of something else that, that we want to talk about this morning, your Kickstarter project, because it seems like reading through through that and, and, and the, the sorts of projects that you're you're putting on that record are just stuff that you made because it was fun. And now you want to make a really nice uh, document of it. Right. That's right. So tell that's, tell that's us about exactly the Kickstarter right. project. So yeah, so I've got this Kickstarter project going to produce this album that we've recorded, you know, completely. And it's most of it is stuff like I've talked about, you know, stuff I've written for friends of mine and that I'm playing guitar on and that I've recorded um, with a guy here where I live in his studio, which um, that was an, another amazing story. I uh, did a a recital in uh, 2012, a couple years ago. It was the first performance recital that I've ever done. Um, 
And a guy from the community came to the concert and just really loved it. And he approached me after the concert and said, he introduced himself. Um, and he said, I own a recording studio in town, but you know, what I really like to do is find artists that I really believe in and want to record and I'll just record whatever you want and I won't charge you. And that's pretty good. He, that's a, that's a good it deal. was, yeah, yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. And so I've done a lot of recording, um, with him, his name is Don Arney, and uh, and now we've got all these recordings, and so uh, I'm trying to put them out on a CD and LP. That's another thing I want to do. So, why an LP? Um, I just love the medium of record. I'm kind of a, a record nerd, vinyl nerd. For and, for, um, for what reason is it an audio thing? Yeah, it's an audio thing, and it's uh, it's. You know, I got back into it, and we're so used to hearing compressed music now, and used to hearing MP3s and stuff. And mm -hmm. um, when I got back into vinyl and got a record player and all that stuff, and put the record on, I was just—I was pretty shocked at at the difference, um, because our ears are so attuned now to hearing music that is compressed. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think it's a huge difference. I think it's a whole experience too. You know. You get like the big jacket. There's a lot of information on it. Could be a lot of cool art on it, and you have to physically, you know, there's a there's a physical involvement with them um, listening to the music with a record, and it's 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 cool for me. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, in as much as I I I I appreciate that sort of thing, I appreciate it as an object. Like the, the, yes, the, yes. The, actually playing the thing is great and it's fun and it's a and it's an experience to actually you know put a needle on the vinyl and and listen to the thing but it's for me maybe i'm just lazy too big a hassle for normal listening um but i totally love the object of the thing um yes kind of yes interesting memento of the of the creative work um and I don't know if there's a great transition from here, but I want to. So we're we're gonna have a link, obviously, to um, the, your Kickstarter project, and it's it's a very cool project, <laughs> and I cannot wait to hear this music. Um, and Thank you. Uh, it seems the things are going pretty well. People should check it out. Um, and uh, the the last thing we wanted to talk about, and we touched on this just briefly at the beginning, but. I wouldn't, and then this is weird and like self promotional to talk about one of our other shows on this show. But uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about all the cool parts for anybody that's watching or listening to this and hasn't checked out all the cool parts yet. What is what is uh, kind of the premise of the show, and what have you been up to lately? Well, the premise of the show, the original premise was to present classical music and to. Basically, an audience, my idea was presenting this music to someone um, who's not in the classical music world, um, who's not familiar with classical music, but might be interested in learning more about classical music. So that was the, the, the original premise. Um, I originally started it in 2010. And um, the reason I started it was that when I graduated school, you know, I um, it was right when the the economy fell through and all that stuff. And I was having a very hard time, you know, I was looking for university jobs and all that stuff and having a very, very hard time getting one. I still don't have one, you know, to this day, we all know how that goes. Um, and, uh, uh, a friend of mine who's a composer, uh, Elliot miles McKinley, he was teaching at a school in, uh, Eastern Indiana at that time. And he invited me to do a composer residency, you know, come out and, share my music and work with the students and stuff, which was a great gesture, you know, even though I was not in a position to reciprocate or anything. And um, so, you know, I went out there and, and did it, and it just sort of relit this fire that I didn't even realize had gone out and, and sort of reminded me of how much I love teaching. And I just thought, you know, if no one's going to give me a chance to teach, you know, I'll just do it myself. So I started this podcast. That was my answer um, to to sort of do that, and uh, that's that's where it all started. And and you know when I came over to Sound Notion, um, I've 
a lot of the well, most of the shows I've done have focused on really recent music, but I've done music from really you know any in all periods of classical music. So, uh, so you've got uh, you've done some really interesting episodes lately, and and I just want to say, and I, I know I've said this on this show before. The interview that you did that you mentioned earlier with Brad Wells, one of the founders of Roomful of Teeth, the vocal ensemble that, that recorded um, Carolyn Shaw's Partita for Eight Voices that won the, the Pulitzer last year, not the one that was just announced this week, but last year, um, is a, a really interesting interview. And I really loved hearing about Roomful of Teeth and how they work and they work just like the band model and how they all kind of go out in, in search of these new sounds that they can make with their voices and then bring them back and say, hey, what can we do when we put all right. these things together? It's just a really fascinating conversation and I'm so glad that, 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 you, that you made it and shared it with us and, and, and uh, I'm just really really happy that, uh, that, that we could be associated with it, much, much <laughs> less ha have it plastered on the, on the front of our page. So, well, uh, thanks, thanks. I mean, I was, really I was happy work. to be associated with Sound Notion. You know, I've been a fan of you guys for a while and I discovered this podcast um, years ago and you had Jim Holt on. That's how I discovered you guys. Mm -hmm. And um, then from there, I discovered Music is Hard, which um, I've told you before, Dave, that I loved that podcast. Which and, needs to come back. Yeah. Well, come everybody, back. Send, everybody send Tim an email and say, hey, <laughs> figure out something to talk about. This was our problem. We ran out of stuff to talk about. We're just not that interesting. <laughs> just ask me. I, I mean, that's how it was at the beginning, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so like, then hey, Anthony, is that a plastic trombone in the background of your shot? That's what I was going to say. What? I was holding no. off to ask. <laughs> <laughs> that is a P-bone manufactured by Khan. Sorry, I was just mine. totally distracted is. by what I was saying. I was saying nice uh, things about Tony's podcast, and then all of a sudden... <laughs> see those in stores. Is that a plastic trombone? Yes, it's a P-Bone manufactured I'm, I'm by aware. Con, and they sound very trombone-like. You'd be amazed. They make a plastic <laughs> trumpet now, too. Well, anyway, so, thank you for, was, for sharing that stuff with us, Anthony. It was it was really great to hear, and you anybody at home should definitely check it out. It's totally worth it. And, and uh, I was So, Anthony, you don't feel like your artistic integrity has been uh, stifled since you've been absorbed into the sound notion, corporate infrastructure, right? <laughs> the, well, the corporate monster hasn't taken away your identity as an individual. The man. Well, I mean, you're, you know, your thugs were here earlier. They, they instructed right. me what to say and what not to say. And, yeah. um, so, so non-disclosure yeah. agreement. So you better watch yourself. <laughs> yeah. Now. Yeah. It's right. good. They're clear at least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we just mentioned um, the, the Pulitzer Prize winning piece from last year. If you didn't catch it, uh, sorry, I'm going to flip this, Sam. Uh, yeah. The Pulitzer Prize winning piece from this year was just announced on Tuesday uh, this week. And congratulations to John Luther Adams, uh, who won for his large orchestral work, Become Ocean, which is a, a work that I have not heard. You can hear some excerpts from it, from its premiere with the Seattle Symphony. It was, it was commissioned by the Seattle Symphony and Ludovic Morlo, who's, who's been killing it since Morlo took over from George Schwartz. Uh, I guess it's been a couple of years now, um, but they're, they're, they've been treading lately, and uh, you, should, you should check out their stuff. And you can find some excerpts of this piece um, around the web in various stories linking to to uh, the Seattle Symphony premiere performance. It's going to be performed just in a few weeks from now, actually, in New York City at the very last edition of the Spring for Music Festival by the Seattle Symphony and Ludovic Morlo again. Um, so check that out if you're in the area, and hopefully we will get a recording of it. Uh, the, the reports that I've read is that there is a recording in the works, um, so that will be fun. And uh, if you're uh, if you're a... New Yorker type person, you can read Alex Ross's review of the work, uh, which contains uh, one of my favorite sentences of, of music criticism that I've ever ever encountered. This is a sentence from, from Alex's review of, uh, of the premiere. It may be one, it may be the loveliest apocalypse in musical history. <laughs> what a sentence, man. Oh, uh, let's, just, let's, just, let's just point out, too, that when is the next time you're going to have two people that have the same Adams. name? Yes, like recognized in some capacity for the Pulitzer Prize in the same year. 
That's right. The, you're right. The the finalists were uh, uh, John C. Adams for the Gospel according to the other Mary, and Chris Cerrone. Chris, yes, Chris Cerrone for another opera. Actually, a um, lot of lot of operas. Invisible I guess the series. Gospel according to the other Mary is technically an oratorio, but it's a passion oratorio. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have all my buzzwords ready for this. A passion oratorio <laughs> for Easter, no less. Yes, yes. Happy yeah. Easter. Um, so yeah, cool, cool stuff. And um, I don't know if there's really anything much to say about the Pulitzer uh, because we haven't heard the music. But um, hopefully, when that recording is made and comes out, we'll have something interesting to say about it. Do you guys have any thoughts? Well, in the, the clips you can see, they show a lot of clips of the orchestra that seems to be during different parts of the piece, and there's a lot of sawing back and forth going on in, like, the jelly. <laughs> like, it seems like it's got a lot of... Like ambient sawing. Ro- yeah, a lot of uh, rolling waves of string noise going on for a long period of time is what it seems like. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a John Luther Adam, Adams kind of space sure. thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, the open Alaskan wilderness kind of John Luther Adams words, I, don't, thing. I don't think he's being ironic when he named the piece Become Ocean. I think he's he's like, <laughs> right on the nose. Well, the, the title <laughs> comes from uh, a, a thing that John Cage wrote describing uh, Harrison's music. Uh, he wrote, uh, listening to Lou Harrison's music, uh, We Become Ocean. Hmm. So um, that's I think that's where he's going for. But I yeah I mean it's about it's about space and, and Adam, Adams has written a lot about that in in the past and, and in fact that that large uh, and and I I've, I've never known if I'm saying this correctly I've been saying Anuxuit, uh the the large spacey uh, that's how you say it. piece um, and uh, that I mean that's very similar in that regard except it's. All, it's even more spaced out because it's literally spaced out because it's supposed to be performed outside. That piece uh, totally from... shreds. Yeah, have you heard it? <laughs> yeah. Have you yeah. experienced it? Uh-huh. Like from live? 9 to 99 percussionists, right? No. <laughs> no, I've just heard it. Okay. Yeah, you, yeah. There's a, they made a record of it, which is really kind of weird. That's weird. That is weird. Uh, and it's got, like, nature sounds and things on it, and I'm not quite sure what to make of it. It's cool. Um, it's just, I don't know. I, I'm not quite sure what I think of making a recording of a work like that. But yeah. anyway, I know some of the Grand Valley folks have participated in the performance of that. I would love to yeah. hear and experience a live performance of that, much as I would love to hear a live performance of Become Ocean. Um, and so I've been been checking out this uh, uh, Alex Ross New Yorker review of Become Ocean since the announcement this week. And that maybe is a, a, a way to transition into our, our next bit of discussion on music criticism. And we've kind of been punting on this for a few weeks. We've been listening to or watching the show, uh, been punting on this this discussion that has kind of been reignited the last month or so around the nature of music criticism from uh, a Ted Joya piece that it he started wrote on with the Daily pop Beast. Music, right? right. They're talking about pop music, but I'm extrapolating. Um, you got a problem with that? No, go ahead. You got a problem with that? Stop away. away. So, want to fight about it? Yeah. So, Ted Joya, if if you've taken a jazz history class ever, you've probably encountered the writings of Ted Joya, or if you've read anything about jazz, uh, you've probably encountered some stuff that he's written. Um, and. He had his. He wrote this piece in the Daily Beast, uh, in the middle of March, called "Music Criticism Has Degenerated into Lifestyle Reporting," and he's talking, as you rightfully point out, about popular music criticism and how we are no longer talking about music when we when we when we talk about pop music. We're talking about what people are wearing and what they look like and who they're dating and things that are not the music and and even we will get sometimes into the lyrics, but even then not very much into the musical sounds. And I, I, and the, he got a lot of backlash and there were a lot of people say, yeah, right on. A lot of people say, well, this is not what it's for. And, and, and a lot of back and forth. And I think this is something that it's important for us to consider because 
we're while while I kind of shrink from describing our endeavor as journalism, mostly mm-hmm. because I have got a lot of respect for real journalists. Um, we are doing a lot of the same things. We are talking ostensibly about music. Um, and so I, 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 I wonder what you guys think about um, the way that we talk about music and the way that pe- smart people like Alex Ross write about music um, and, and w- whether you think we're doing a good job of it. Anybody want to take that? <laughs> Class. <laughs> Bones. Bones. That oh, person has an idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start if you guys want. Go for it. <laughs> Tell it. You're, you're doing a very specific show that is actually you know about this is a piece of music that you might dig. Well, right. Um, I, I don't know. I've never thought of myself as a music journalist, but um, I guess a critic that's kind maybe? of what I do. But... Um, well, you know, as for us about the the article, um, and I love the response. Um, the response to the article I thought was great um, by um, Jody I'm, Rosen. I'm blanking now, yes, Jody Julian Rosen. Vulture. Exactly yeah. that um, that response I thought was terrific. Um, the initial article, man, was uh, I, I, you know. It, the internet is, we all know the internet has tromped on the way things were done, right? Um, so uh, I guess that, you know, there used to be a lot more music criticism in periodicals that he's talking about, um, physical periodicals, newspapers, these sort of things. Um, I think that kind of criticism still exists, but I think it's moved to other areas. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, um, you know, I'm not sure. But his assertion that, like, everything is about lifestyle and and uh, this sort of thing, um, I think he, he is missing the reasons maybe why that is. Um, and this goes way, way back. I mean, you can go back even in the classical world to the Ballet Russe, you know, to Diaghilev, and, um, you know, he invited controversy to generate publicity. You know, because Diaghilev's number one concern was keeping the ballet ruse going and getting, getting butts people's in the seats. butts in the seats. That's right. And mm-hmm. I think his his he was also concerned with creating great art. But I think that was his number one concern, you know, and he would you can read in letters, you know, that he would have this correspondence with composers with Satie and and uh, Stravinsky and stuff that he specifically asked for that kind of stuff, you know. Um, and, you know, when you have an article that, um, focuses on controversy and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, it's hard enough now to get people to buy music. It's very hard for, to get people to buy CDs and stuff like that. Um, I would imagine it's even harder to get people's butts off of their couch and go and see live groups. So I think this sort of lifestyle controversy thing um, might be aimed at you know getting a general population to spend money on music to keep the music industry going. I think that's one reason why maybe there's so much of that going on. But there, I think there is serious music criticism still going on. It's just migrated to other places that maybe he's not really aware of. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I think he's I think he's a little out of out of touch. I mean, one um, thing that think, he that really he, I... Well, I, one thing that really stood out to me was one thing he says in the final uh, paragraph of his article. And he says, um, without smart, independent critics who know their stuff, everything collapses into hype, public relations, and the almighty dollar. We have already seen where that leads us. Take a look at the tread line, or trend line of recording sales. So he's saying that the decline in recording sales is the result of bad criticism <laughs> no yeah that, yeah, yeah. I mean, well and, and and i think rosen makes a really interesting point that he doesn't actually cite anything in particular as an example that's of right. bad writing that's right. um and, right. and 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 like you said he's clearly just looking in the wrong places and if you are looking in vanity fair expecting cultural commentary then perhaps you started your search in the wrong place that's true but i mean i'd say I'd say Vanity Fair very much used to be 
at the forefront of cultural commentary. Well, Chris, and now we have to look somewhere else. I, I guess uh, yeah, you just have true. to I know mean, to look somewhere else. Per, per, yeah, I mean, perhaps it's just a matter of he likes these publications that used to do things a certain way 30 years ago and they're not doing them anymore it, to um, me it's that he just doesn't know and didn't care to find out and he just wanted to complain it's a little whiny cry I, don't, baby article. I don't think he <laughs> well yes i mean but i don't think he he doesn't know the nature of uh, our love of celebrity especially in this right. country i mean he's certainly not shying away from that i mean he, he knows the reasons he's just yes complaining well to it. me there's there's a there's a couple of big disconnects one is he's he, whenever he talks about good criticism being valuable, he means it in the context of classical music. And when he talks about bad criticism being bad, he's talking about popular music. Um, the response that uh, um, uh, Judy Rosen, Jody Rosen wrote um, basically points out that it was poorly written and uses lots of stereotypes that are kind of unsupported. But it's interesting that she ultimately makes the argument that, yeah, pop critics have to talk about lifestyle to an excessive amount, but that doesn't mean they're not good critics. She's She is accepting the fact that if you're a pop critic, writing about that stuff is one of the things that's a part of your craft now. So if you're good at it, you're good at doing that part of it too. Mm -hmm. um, and then on New Music Box, um, Molly Sheridan stipulates that these concerns are related to pop music, and because of that, we shouldn't even be considering them. Basically, to me, was the point of that. Um, to me, the whole, the whole, the the entire issue is that um, they talk about criticism as if it's something that's the same now as it's always been. Criticism used to be like one-way communication, where you don't haven't seen it, and it's in a city where you don't live, and you read it. And you get an impression about it and form a future plan about what you're going to do with it. Now, criticism has the capacity to be a conversation. Uh, and people don't want to talk about the music theory behind something and what makes it cool. They want to talk about what the person was wearing. So mm -hmm. they do that because that's what's going to generate clicks and views and interest and advertisers like that. Well, and the other thing is that in, in coming from the three-channel universe to the Internet, we get a lot more options in the – the 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 sources of criticism that right. we that, that we put in our in our brains and there are places where there is crappy music criticism and in those places you will find a lot of public buyers that are are interested in buying copies of magazines where they're talking about lifestyle things and celebrity whatever gossip stuff but you can also dig into other places, and if and if if you would like to engage music on that level, there is a place for you. And if you would like to engage music on a different level, there is a different place for you. And there doesn't, there's no longer um, a a one or small number of stops shopping for music criticism. If you want yeah. something that is extraordinarily thoughtful, you're going to find it on the internet. And if you want something that is extraordinarily salacious and vacuous, you'll find that on the internet as well. Um, and and well, you pick your sources. I think he's kind of lamenting that, you know, maybe most people aren't talking about the music. You know, the music, man, like that, it's not like about that anymore, I guess. Um, you know, people aren't coming over people's houses to have listening parties so much anymore, I don't, as they were in 1968. Because they don't have to. Right. But I mean, like that's the culture that he might love, you know. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I don't think upset. might is a is a question. But we can have our listening party on the web. We can have yeah. we can I can listen to a piece on Spotify and send you a link, and then we can have a conversation on Twitter, right? right? And so, anybody else that's heard the piece, it, it can find our conversation and contribute to it. Like how how is that not a better I'm, situation I, for for a, a listening party than a listening party? I'm not. I'm not saying those aren't like legitimate ways to have a listening party or or whatever. But I, I'm just playing devil's advocate to tell you like why he feels the way he does. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, but I completely agree with you. At and the same and time. the reason is that he's old. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, he's I have wrong. to duck out early. All right. Fine. Um, but in the city, continue Patrick? this conversation. Fine. Adios. So <laughs> I'll see you guys soon. <clears throat> Patrick. Is having to leave us because he is a professional and lives in the city where they do <laughs> professional things. 
Um, <laughs> things to do. Things to do. Things to do. Um, things to do. Indeed. Things so, to do. Uh, the, the, the next thing that, that we have to, to talk about uh, is this study about repeats. Things to do. Things to do. <laughs> things to do. Turns out people like things to do. Repeats. Things to do. Repeats. Um, so, uh, we, we sometimes talk about these scientific studies that tell us what people like in the sounds that they that they uh that they engage with and there was a this study that was published i guess it's a couple of weeks ago now um by a psychologist elizabeth margulis uh, and she took the music of luciano berrio um and looped it in somewhat random places and played it for people along with one that did not have those loops. And people tended to like the one that did have the loops more than the one that did not have the loops. And her conclusion was people like repeats. Uh, people <laughs> like hearing things that are familiar. And I had several reactions to this. One was, why do we automatically assume that people aren't going to like Luciano Berrio. I, I am fundamentally, I, I'm distrustful of studies that fundamentally say that, that, that Luciano Berrio is unlikable because I think his music is very likable. And I also think that it is very repetitive if you know what you're listening for in the repeats, right? If yeah. you know that this idea is going to come back in a, in, not exactly the same way, but in some way later, then I think that is just as much of a, a valuable repetition as anything else. And, I, and that's the way that this has to work, right? You have to, you have to know that it is not going to be a literal repeat, but rather that it is going to be some kind of, of, of transformation. And that I think is actually more interesting than a literal repeat. And, and, and I think it's something that, that Barrio in, in particular does very, very well. Um, and if, if people were listening differently, they might be more prepared to hear those connections. And we've talked about, we, we talked about a study last year uh, in February on Sound Notion about uh, people liking certain intervals better. Uh, people finding certain dissonant, acoustically dissonant intervals less dissonant because of the way that they uh, were taught about them. So they came up uh, and brought in some people that were not trained musicians and said, hey, what do you think of these two notes together? And some of them were, were dissonant intervals and some of them were not dissonant intervals and the ones that were dissonant intervals people tended not to like and then they sent them to little ear training classes and just taught them not even to like the intervals but just to identify them and that that amount of repetition and recognition caused them to think of those sounds as less dissonant it, when it they heard the familiarity them later. thing and, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so there's a familiarity thing that I think is at play here. And it's not necessarily as much about repetition as much as it is about familiarity. And if people mm -hmm. recognize these these repetitive figures as more familiar, then I think they would find them less annoying. Well, I think or it less is scary uh, at least. I think Berio's music, but I, the thing that pops to mind is particularly as Sequenza's, uh, on in the range of classical music. They just have a lot of information in them, you know. Like, yeah. And uh, and so I I hear us kind of talking about two different kinds. What of do you mean a lot of information? Well, so like all the sounds that a particular instrument could make, you know, sure. <laughs> all the way these intervals could work with the different timbres, and like relating these diff like relating through slightly varied repetition or using an idea in different ways across different timbres or across but different intervals. I think intervals. they're relatively economical as well. Sure, yeah. I mean, so it, it covers a lot of ground. And and so as as you say in in this music there's not a lot of like literal repeating where you get the same idea more uh like exactly the same idea more than one time. 
you might and so like in analyzing a piece like this where the whole thing has different relationships of different variations on an idea um, you might get more familiar with all of it by listening to the piece over and over again and that's yeah. that's not an uncommon thing to like expose yourself to music expose, uh, and educate yourself in that, what the ideas are so I think uh, and I think that music that has more literal repeating might just get you at that idea, like <laughs> like pound in your face a little bit more, where the pop chorus has the thing over and over again. So like you really get that idea. Like there's no way you're going to get through the first listening without having an understanding of what that melody is. Yeah, and I feel like the the, the whole idea of repeating something in music is a lot about teaching the audience what a thing sounds like. Yeah, conveying right? an idea, exactly. You're, you're, you're teaching them this is what the chorus sounds like, and I'm going to repeat it so that when it comes back later, the, this repetitive figure is, is going to mean something to you because you, you've been taught it, and to teach it, we repeat things. You know, you, you drill knowledge to, to learn knowledge, and we're going to kind of do a little drill to learn this thing. What, Sam, what are you doing? It's about form. That's, nobody said the word yet, so I was going to yeah, say yeah. it. Hit it. Like, hearing something repeated is one of the easiest ways to start creating a sense of form in a listener's mind, and that's what people want. Saying that, saying that they like repetition, to me, is a way of saying people like to feel like they know the form of what they're listening to. In a pop song, it's really easy, because like you said, the chorus, and incidentally, the one of the I'll have a link to this. This guy has been doing analysis of pop songs. He points Own out that Lady Gaga, slate. yeah, that Lady Gaga puts the the name of the song in the chorus or in the song itself as many times as possible, so that it has uh, cross cultural possibilities. Non English speakers can still hear that word said over and over and over and over again, so they pick up on it and know the name of the song, um, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, it's about form. People like in, uh, I'm, I think of the vocal sequenza, um, like when you hear, ha, 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 you know, you hear that multiple times, you can't think. I mean, your brain immediately goes, oh, I heard that before. Don't perform you know? any more of it. We can't, we can't afford the, the licensing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I have a recital next week. I'm doing that piece. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But to me, that, that piece is 100% about repetition, meaning like hearing references to things you've already heard and how that creates a map in the listener's mind of the form of the piece. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. I always enjoy these studies because they tell us about, even, even when there is what I think is a somewhat flawed premise, they, they, I, I like learning about how people... Uh, cognate uh, that's not the right word how, how, how music cognition how listeners psychologically understand the sounds that are coming in because it gives us another thing to play with as composers um mm -hmm. and and that's always uh, an interesting thing to to look at is how it's going to be received not only by people who are you know as sam likes to say expensively trained musicians like all of us on the panel but people who are not expensively trained musicians like most of the people hopefully most of the people listening to music um and maybe that's another discussion for another episode of 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 sound notion yeah. i got uh, your expensively certainly trained something we, right. we're going to talk about next week uh with larry and arlene dunn um so, uh, do anybody have any other thoughts on these? Go, well, Sam, go my, ahead. Oh, go ahead, my, Anthony. My reaction to the study was just kind of, well, duh. I mean, people like repeats, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that using Barrio is—I don't know—it's an interesting example. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know poor Barrio gets picked on and. And stuff like that, and we all appreciate Barrio's music and stuff. I think, um, I think what they were saying is, you know, it's about, uh, you know, stuff that you can hang on to, listening to it once. You know what I mean? And uh -huh. if for someone who's not familiar with Barrio's music and they sit down in a concert hall and hear one of the sequences one time, um, it's going to be very tough, you know, for them yeah. to to hang on to anything that they just heard. And, you know, with us, you know, we are perfectly willing to sit down with the music and listen to it multiple times and, and look at the score and all that stuff. 
uh, most people that that you know listening to it multiple times maybe, but you know studying it in depth with a score that would never even occur to most people. And even if you gave them a score, they would not be able to do that because they can't read music. Um, so uh, I'm not really making a point here. I'm just saying um, <laughs> that. Uh, you know, this music, uh, Barrio Sequenza's uh, appeal to us because, you know, we're willing to, to make the investment to learn this music and, and, and hear its beauties and its, you know, its form and all that stuff, which takes a lot, you know, several listens and stuff. And most people are just not going to go down that road. You know, they need that repetition um, to, you know, hang on to that music in their mind. So, but yeah, people like repetition. I mean, music, uh, yeah. human, humans making music from the very beginning has been contingent upon repetition. I yeah, it's right. With going, ah, yeah. uh, it's just one long repetition, right? Whoa. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the reason that I mean, a, a lot of cultures had music originally to help them remember things, right? To right. like they would, this would, this was part of the 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 storytelling tradition or the the religious tradition is that they would, you know, encode this information in songs so that they could help remember it. Yeah, it's um, a memory trick. And so, yeah. and so, the repetition is is a is an important part of that. Well, even in the old heroic epics that were exactly. all yeah um, that were all transmitted orally, you know, um, were you know arranged into meters and all that sort of musical kind of meters and stuff to you know because someone had to memorize the entire thing, which could be really, really the Odyssey, long. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, Sam, speaking of memorizing music, I've got a band for you that can memorize as much music as you want, and they can do it at the speed of light. Holy cow. That doesn't make sense to me. I think you're lying. <laughs> the, I have two inter I have two related stories today. The Z machines, uh, there's a group of scientists who built some robots that could play drum set and keyboard and guitar and meaning like actually plucking the strings on a guitar. Uh, the guitar player has 78 says fingers, but it means it has 78 discrete guitar picks. Um, I read a little bit about it that has no velocity control, like it picks at one volume level. Um, the, the drum set player, quote, has 22 arms, and the robot play, and the keyboard player plays keyboard with lasers. Um, <laughs> it's interesting, a, uh, a electronic musician named Square Pusher wrote some pieces. And what's interesting to me about this is that there have been lots of people who do Square Pusher, like a drum and bass artist, who does everything electronically with some samples and stuff, but it's all electronically controlled. But doing live action covers of Square Pusher songs has become a popular thing among, you know, certain badass bands who want to demonstrate their badassness, you know, that we can do a Square Pusher song live. Um, right. So Square Pusher was actually uh, commissioned to write one song and then it wrote an entire album for the Z Machine robots. And Dave, if you want to play that video starting at about four minutes and thirty seconds, it's pretty interesting to uh, watch. I'm not, I'm not set up to play a video today. Uh, all right. Well, give me some it, warning. It's very, it's it's very interesting. You can watch all the individual guitar picks slamming and everything. Um, yeah. There's another artist that's that's been doing this for years. Um, is the jazz guitarist Pat Metheny? Yeah, He's the Orchestrion. Been, the orchestrion, mm -hmm. yeah, he's he's been doing that for for quite a few years now. But it's the same idea. Yeah, well, and doesn't he? Does he control his live? Like he's got some kind of guitar controller thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he's got a he's in front of a computer and he's got things sequenced, and then I think he's got other things that he can trigger on the fly, and then he of course will comp and solo over the music. But yeah. Yeah. I think I think what sets this apart is, and if you if you see it, you'll understand is the technical exactitude. I mean, this is like if you're familiar with Square Pusher at all. If Square Pusher had a band, this would be it. I mean, the ability to play anything in any rhythm with perfect accuracy, but sounds live because it is. It is actually a guitar making the noises and an actual drum set making the noises. So it sounds pretty cool. Yeah, uh, and I think just the audio like world that Pat Metheny and Square Pusher live in. I think Pat Metheny, yeah. his his whole robotics project sounds like his music and this stuff sounds yeah. like Square Pusher. It's, it's pretty right. awesome. 
Well, so on the one hand, we have the perfect band. This, uh, the Z Machines band can't miss a note. Well, we also have an example of the perfect pop singer. We've talked about on the show before the Japanese pop sensation Hatsune Miku. Is that right, Dave? Go for it. We'll call um, it right. She, she's a computer-generated Japanese pop star who performs as a hologram, often with a live band. We talked about it before, but the twist here is she's actually going on tour with Lady Gaga. Uh, her tour of North America next month is going to have a live band supporting the holographic Hatsune, Hatsune Miku, the Japanese holographic pop star. Um, Pretty cool. To me, that, that's just mind-blowing. How long before this kind of thing penetrates the <laughs> classical music world? I don't where, know. Like, <laughs> Joshua Bell will sell for, like, you know, $50,000 at subscription. I'll open your symphony concert, you know, um, to multiple places hologrammed uh, discreetly. Mm. This kind yeah. of thing is filtering down into other composers, you know, I have a friend, a good friend of mine who's a composer, a Japanese composer. He lives in Japan. His name is Mutsuhito Ogino. And he's recently written some songs using this software developed by Yamaha called Vocaloid. Do you guys, have you guys yeah, ever heard of this? Yeah, I think that might be the thing that drives this, this uh, hologram thing. Yeah, it's, I mean, he released these songs and I heard them and um, it's completely 100% synthesized. But yeah, you can program it with words and stuff, and it sounds. Um, I mean, you know, there are places obviously we can tell it's not real, but I mean, it sounds pretty amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she's like, you want she can sing perfectly in tune and phrase however you program her. <laughs> this is like the producer's the producer his, his ultimate dream. He's got complete control over the singer. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's, that's really cool. I like it a lot. Uh, those two, those two stories about um, kind of yielding some amount of, of performance control to computers is really interesting. I, and, and I think composers should be experimenting with these kinds of things they, to really engage with technology the way other spheres have, have been engaging with technology. I just read a, about a study from a few years ago on humor and technology where these researchers were trying to uh, write a, a program that could look at a text and find where in the text it made sense to insert that's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I think is a brilliant use of research money. I uh, think So I think we need to develop the one that will insert into any of our uh, Sound Notion podcasts that totally shreds. That totally shreds. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, man, did you hear that new recording of Lark ascending? Uh, that totally, totally shreds. shreds. Totally, that totally shreds. shreds. <laughs> so, um, that is going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Thank you, Anthony, for joining us this morning. It was delightful to talk to you, and I'm so glad that happening. we actually finally got to have you on the show. We've been meaning to have you on the show for a while, so thanks for your time, man. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, and and if if you have not, if you're watching or listening to this show and you have not yet checked out Anthony's uh, All the Cool Parts podcast, you should definitely do that and definitely check out that Brad Wells interview that we talked about earlier. And then after you do that, or maybe before, depending on when you do it, time is a factor here, you should check out his Kickstarter project uh, because it, it there's some really cool stuff there. There is not enough sweet electric guitar music in concert in the concert music world <laughs> uh especially electric guitar and other instruments which i think is to me the really compelling part of of the the, the project so you should definitely check those out we'll have the links to those and everything else that we talked about including uh places where you can hear at least some streaming excerpts of john luther adams new pulitzer prize winning work become ocean um and that will all be up on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can check out Anthony's uh, website at anthonyjosephlandman.com. And uh, all the cool parts is at soundnotion.tv slash ACP. Is there anything else I'm missing, Anthony, that you want to plug? Uh, no, I, I think that was it. Um, as far as stuff coming up, just the concerto. Um, uh, a friend, actually a friend of both of our shows, Mirren A. Shim, is playing a piece of mine soon. Rock on. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Excellent. I, I don't know when soon. But 
Well, we will yeah. we will link to those things when they happen on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. Um, you can leave a comment there. You can also connect with us and continue our conversation about music criticism or uh, robots in music or repeats and Barrio and all of those cool things. Uh, or John robot Luther Adams. Criticism. Or what? Robot criticism. Robot criticism. Mm. That's the answer. Uh, Alaskan robot criticism. <laughs> uh, Pulitzer Prize That's... winning Alaskan robot criticism that repeats. And, uh, you know, all those things. We're, we're happy to have those conversations as repetitively as you would like on our site, on Twitter, where we're at Sound Notion. I'm at Dave McDow. Nate is at Nate Tree. Sam is at, Voc, or at Housegoy. I was just thinking that I should mention that Patrick, who left us a few moments ago, is at Vox Shibuya, and Anthony is at Anthony Landman? Yes. Excellent. Uh, at Anthony Landman. Uh, and so we would love to continue these conversations with you uh, in the Twitterverse, Twitter sphere, twi- on Twitter. Uh, you should like us on Facebook. Um, and we can we can talk there. We we post links to, to Facebook throughout the week when we find interesting articles as well. Um, and you can subscribe to us on YouTube. And of course, subscribe to this show and all the cool parts and our other shows at SoundNotion.tv in the iTunes Store, uh, where you can find all all the all the world's fine podcasts aggregated in one place for your listening and or watching pleasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I, I I heard a sigh. Uh, you can also find us on Stitcher and wherever else you like to find your podcasts. Um, if you'd like to support our show, tell your friends. Use our Amazon affiliate link. Give us some money. We like money. Uh, it's not free to do this show, and it's nice to, to have a little bit of support, and we appreciate everyone who does that. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Love. Thanks again so much for watching or listening, and we'll see you back next week. <laughs>